Good morning, everyone. This session is um, recorded for the first half where we have individuals sharing their experience living through transitions. And then the second half, as we go into breakout rooms, that is not going to be recorded for your confidentiality and comfortability. We want you to be able to turn on your video and be able to have really beneficial conversation. So that area will not be recorded. Um, and so we're just getting some more people joining us this morning. Welcome. Fantastic. Okay, so Cindy, I am going to unmute myself and turn off my camera and I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Good morning, everyone. So today we're going to be talking about transition for families. And transition for families requires planning, support and education. This morning, we'll be sharing, discussing, and listening to families with experience in transition. And they'll include transitioning into a wheelchair, transitioning into adult care, transitioning through schools like elementary school, high school, and university, and transitioning to respiratory supports. So because we've got an hour, only an hour to do this, we're gonna start right away here. And I would like to introduce Riley, who is a graduate from our neuromuscular clinic. Take it away, Riley. Thank you very much, Cindy. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Riley Janachik, and well, obviously, as, you, as Cindy has said before, I will be talking about transitioning into a wheelchair. All right, so while I did get my power chair myself, I will admit um, I was actually quite anxious before getting it because at the time I didn't want to make my disease look more apparent. And I thought that the wheelchair itself would make it more apparent that way. Um, but in the end, I actually found myself uh, to be enjoying it. And I felt a little bit more independent upon uh, well, actually having the wheelchair. Originally, before I got the power chair, it was hard for me, especially throughout high school, where I had my manual chair, it was hard, it was hard for me to wheel myself around because I would get too tired upon doing so. And it was also kind of embarrassing to have someone push me around as well. And, and I, uh, even though I could walk, if I was to walk, walk for an example, a long period of time or too fast, I would end up falling and that's actually beyond embarrassing. So when I did transition into the power chair, like I said, I was anxious, but in the end, it was actually kind of fun. I got to, uh, I got to go faster than other people. I was able to get away from other, from, well, people. And uh, well, I just felt really independent and I felt like I, w I was an equal to my friends instead of just this one kid who can't really do anything by himself. It actually made a huge difference for me, especially uh, especially when it came to um, driving to school and back home. It was it was actually fun for me because I always wanted to do that. But and it was also kind of useful because in the end, like you don't want your mom to have to pick you up from school all the time. Right. And I was in grade 12. So at the time, that was also kind of embarrassing. But I, the only time I would really need to have my mom pick me up is if it was pouring rain outside, or I could just be that one person and drive home with a massive golf umbrella over my head. Um, it, overall, I'd say transitioning into wheelchair was probably the best things that's probably ever happened to me in my life, especially throughout high school and college, especially. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence in myself and I felt more independent. And honestly, I was just, it was great. And I got to hang out with my buddies after school all the time too. So that's also a plus. Uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Riley. That was great. So next up, I am going to get Rochelle to actually show us a video. Oh, yes. And next up will also be Riley's mom, Anne. But we're going to start off with a video. And I call it Mike's video because Mike is a was a patient from our clinic and he will also be speaking later. And his family did a video on transition. It's about a three minute video and transitioning from BC Children's to adult care.
for for the transition process is like being on the edge of a canyon and you've got to cross a bridge but the bridge is out and you've got to get down that canyon and get up on the other side everybody gives you the tools that you need but you've got to get down that canyon and up the other side completely on your own and there is nobody you know exactly waiting for you on the other side Children's Hospital did such an excellent job of taking care of everything. You suddenly say, well, what happens now? So there was the matter of um, equipment replacements. There was a matter of lining up doctors. Um, who do we rely on now that the Children's Hospital is in our past? At the time of transition, one of the big benefits that you lose is the shift from pediatric to the adult world and there's a full year where you don't have any funding for any equipment. It's leaving that wonderful warm cocoon where all your appointments were set up. Your, uh, you had a history with your doctors. Uh, we were now going to be going to unknowns, doctors we had no history with, doctors we didn't know. Michael was going to be making his own appointments. Uh, it's again very easy to panic and be alarmed by the whole situation I'm wondering if you're gonna have to explain your whole medical history again to a whole new person and so I can see how it can very easily become this big scary thing because it is even when I had a good experience I can still say it was still kind of an overall scary process things do build up and you do think, oh, I've got the weight of the world on my shoulders. How are we going to manage? And I think if you can just grasp onto the positive and think of the good and the fun and the things you can do, and I think that will get you through. I felt like I had fully transitioned into the adult world when I finally actually met face to face with my specialists and saw them and after had, having the meetings and sitting down and talking with them I really felt like that was that was it that was where things were going to go and how things were going to be and that I'd actually had made it to that point. Thank you very much, Rochelle, for putting that on for us. And next, I'd like to introduce to you Anne, who is Riley's mom. Thank you, Anne. Hi, thanks, Cindy. Um, yeah, I was like watching that video and thinking, wow, like, you know, he, he really articulates the situation very, very well. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about our transition to adult world. Riley's 20 now, so we're, we've been in the process for a couple of years now. I would say that initially, um, you know, I was a little bit of laissez-faire about it, like, oh, it'll be fine. We went to, I think, three different um, three different transition days and and those were you know the first one you sort of sit back and go oh yeah well you know it, it, you know we got we got we got time and then the second one was oh we, well we still have time but what was that guy's name and then by the third one it was like oh my god who is he oh my god you know it was that you know the stress really starts to to input and uh, you know Cindy would give us these these lists and I'd be going over them madly with Riley like do you know how to do this yet do you know how to do that yet and you know do I know how to do this yet so you know definitely I think by the time you get to that grade 12 transition day, you're, you're a little bit in panic mode. Um, more than likely, like me, I got my social worker had phoned me, I think, when Riley was 17 and a half and said, okay, go and apply for um, benefits now. And I'm like, huh? 
what do you mean? He's like 17, I got lots of time, which, you know, in the end, you don't have lots of time. Um, you know, as, as we pointed out in the video, um, uh, you know, for, for Riley, the, where the funding was concerned, it was more about, you know, how do we pay for physio? How do we do this? How do we do that? And, um, you know, one thing that really <laughs> was, was, you know, sort of came home with us is that really take advantage on, um, take advantage for as much of the services you can before your child turns 18. For us, that meant, you know, making sure we made, went to those transition days, starting to take notes, pay attention to what, you know, who's there and what, what their advice is. And also for us was, you know, take advantage of any of the other services that, was, that were made available. And for Riley, one of those was um, actually going and talking to a vocational counselor, Gia Strong. And that was really key for him because, you know, our school really didn't have any idea of what to tell him. They didn't really know any of his options, um, what he could do, uh, whether it was work or, or, or school. They didn't really have any, you know, we really didn't see any support on that end. So when we're transitioning at that point, you know, to actually go and be able to talk to, a, it was a lady named Vaughn and she was amazing. And what made it even more powerful for Riley is that she was also in a wheelchair. So I think he could really relate to her that, you know, when, when she was telling him stuff, she wasn't lying. You know, no, these are your realities of the real world. This is what is available to you. So, let, you know, time to pay attention. Um, one of the things that, you know, and it was funny, I got a call from a, another mom whose daughter has a, other, other issues, but, you know, how do you do that BDW, P, PWD form, like that online form? And they're asking me this, and, you know, it was really quite stressful even filling out the forms for to get money, you know. Yes, he's a person with disabilities, but of the form that we filled out, that was a tiny little section of about, felt like 500 questions. And then even still, you know, we didn't really know how to answer them. We went into one of the, the, um, the offices and they're like, oh, we can't help you here you have to do it all line and I was like well well who's helping like you can't well then you know and all you could do is fill it she was oh just fill it out eventually someone will get a hold of you which you know doesn't give you a lot of confidence that you're you feel like you're doing it right um you know uh one of the things that did help was that because we in the transition days we did meet some of the adult doctors that Riley was going to see there was some comfort in that that when we did go and see his new neurologist Dr. Jacks it was like oh yeah he's I've seen you you know he's seen her two three times already and that was quite comfortable that that you know um, having gone to these transitional days same with Dr. Rhodes his pulmonary guy you know these were familiar faces it wasn't as, as scary as you know um, as described in the video when you have no idea who these people are and they have no idea what your history or what your disease is all about but you know we did have the the few situations we'd gone to see a cardiologist who really had no idea he was trying to pawn us off to another doctor and and then again we went back to to dr jack and sort of you know said to the situation to her she's oh no i got this and she managed to get us into it with a new cardiologist that's he's a multidisciplinary guy under the cardiac umbrella and very interested in riley's um, situation and hey, this is great. We're moving on now, but definitely that was you know when when the expectation that you have with children is that you're going to get your your email reminders, you're going to get your phone calls. You know, Belinda's going to make sure you get your agenda before you come in. There isn't any of that in the in the adult world. You really do have to keep track. You have to know when your next appointment is. You have to make another appointment, and that was one of the ones. All of a sudden, I'm like, hey, hang on, when was the last time you saw you know so and so? And then realizing that, wait a minute, I guess we have to call them. They're not going to call us. Um, and then, you know, obviously with this day and age with COVID, it, it's making things more challenging as well. And for Riley, it was it was a bit of a um, more than challenging when we realized that, okay, he can't go into St. Paul's to get his saldronic acid. Like he can't go in there to get his, his regular infusion. The hospital's not going to let us. So it's like, okay, where are we going to go? And, and definitely Dr. Gill, his endocrinologist was helpful with that. She hooked us up with a, um, a clinic, but then here's the adult world. I called the clinic, talked to that. That's great. He's go, okay, so you'll bring your own saldronic acid. I'm like, what, what do you mean? I'll bring my own. Like, I don't have it sitting in my drawer. And, you know, here was the situation that, um, you know, they didn't have any in their pharmacy. So, you know, if you could find some before you came in the middle of COVID, I'm like, are you kidding me? And after calling about six different pharmacies who had 
no idea what I was talking about. We were lucky enough that my husband's friend, his wife works for shoppers. She got on the computer and bingo, she, I got it for you. It's at this one. And you know, my husband went and picked it up, but you know what? That was luck of the draw for us. If, if I had, I literally was going through the phone book, calling shoppers drug marks, trying to find zoldrotic acid. So, you know, here's another reality where, you know, at children's, you just roll on into the section and just wait for yourself. And that was great. So, um, and definitely, you know, um, using the different doctors that you are given once you go in the adult world, having a physiologist, which I really did not know what it was, and a lot of people don't, but he's a rehab specialist. Our Dr. Borquez, Riley always has to tell me how to say it because I always just call him Dr. B. But, you know, just having, you know, accessing them, they know a lot more about what the different things that you may be going through into the adult world than for example, your regular GP, when it came to getting an OT, you know, my GP wasn't really going to be much help in, especially he didn't even live in my community, um, which I think is a lot of people's situations with the GP. But, you know, I got Dr. B, I said, oh, I think we need an OT. We're building this house and Riley's going to have his own suite, but I don't know if I, we've done it right with the counters and all, you know, right away within a week, he had someone calling me and, 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 you know, in less than a, you know, I guess it was just over a week, um, our new OT showed up and came to the house and, you know, checked in with us and all of a sudden got funding for us for a lift that we were putting in. So definitely the services are there, but it's it's using the people in the community that are there to help you. Um, and sort of in closing, one of the biggest things that, you know, I think that we're still struggling with in the adult world is how much Riley's involved. You know, it's pretty easy for me to still be mom and, oh, you know, and this and that, but, you know, we're really trying to make sure that, you know, when he gets those Zoom appointments during right now during COVID or, or a phone call appointment that they're calling him directly, that maybe I'm in the room to help out with info, but Riley's taking that call, um, that he's definitely aware of, he's got his meds on his, in his phone, that he can tell, you know, doctors, yeah, this and this and this, but, you know, definitely the adult world, you know, he always freaks out if he gets a message from WD on his computer, oh, they want to, I was like, it's probably just telling you some payment things, just relax, you know, definitely there, we're still bridging all of those gaps and, and, and figuring all those things out, but, you know, I, I think in closing, what, what I would really say is that use all of the services before they turn 18. That's one of the key things. And, and we did a little bit, we but we didn't do enough, I don't feel. And then definitely use the doctors, use the ones that are in the adult world that you feel comfortable with that can help you and, and can't say enough about the physiologists, even though I didn't know what they were. He's been amazing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. And just to clarify, when Anne is talking about physiologists, she's actually thinking of a physiatrist. Did I say it wrong again? Oh my okay. God. Well, maybe that's why she knows what I'm talking about. But that's okay. That was awesome. That was really, really good. Lots of good uh, information in that one. That's for sure. Oh, Riley, <laughs> coming on there. Oh, hello. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much. Next, we have V, who's gonna be coming on, and her son is also an adult graduate from the Neuromuscular Clinic. She's gonna be talking about transitioning from schools. So from to into, to into elementary school, to secondary school, and then again to university. Thanks, V. Hi, everyone. Can everyone, can everyone hear me? My name is V. I'm the mother of um, Sean, who is 23 with DMD, and he's um, just about, he's going to graduate from UBC this spring. He's just finishing off his last few credits, and he's going to get a Bachelor of Commerce. So um, he was diagnosed um, just before we started his kindergarten year. So um, it's a long journey, you know, so you go to preschool and then to kindergarten and elementary school, high school, and then uh, for us on to university. Um, and the most important thing is at the very beginning of a journey, at the beginning of elementary school, you have to um, have the school do their, they have to do an official kind of assessment, and then they get a ministry designation as being a person with a disability. And that, acts, that allows you to access all kinds of services, special education, um, that triggers an individual education plan, um, where they can specify all the accommodations that are necessary, you know, for, for the students. So we did that with Sean. And... My philosophy basically was at the beginning of every year, I would make sure that the whole team got together and, you know, not only every teacher that he would be interacting with, principal, vice principal, and then every school has a team where they have physiotherapists, occupational therapists, even a psychologist. 
So as many people as possible, get them together and have like a kickoff meeting at the beginning of every year. And, um, you know, I would bring in coffee and, you know, have some treats. So give people a little bit of incentive and um, basically explain, you know, um, Sean's condition. Um, the other important thing I found to explain was like how much your child knows about his or her condition. So giving the teacher clues as to how to talk to them about it. You don't want the teacher inadvertently saying something that's ahead of where you are as a family in terms of explaining the condition to your child. And in later years of elementary school, within that IEP that you set up with this team, you can also ask for things that your child might need, um, a quiet place to de-stress if they need that, um, extra time to get from one place to another, like for recess, maybe having a buddy leave with them five minutes earlier so they can get to the playground before the whole hallways get crowded. Um, things like, you know, he doesn't need to do 100 multiplication questions if he proves on 10 with varying difficulty that he can do them. So, and the occupational, school occupational therapist was very good at the very beginning too. She came in and did a full assessment and modified his desk, um, made sure he had a slant board for writing to make it easier to write. And, you know, just modifying length of assignments, that kind of thing. And the other important thing in a bunch of school is inclusive, inclusivity. So the school, we're in the Richmond School District. So our school buses, the ones that are accessible to a wheelchair only hold, I think 15 kids maximum. So for school field trips, you know, that would mean that Sean couldn't go, but what would happen is I would do it. I mean, I would take a day off work and made sure that I would take my car, get him in there, drive him to the um, field trip. So you really have to push for inclusivity all the time. Um, Sean was one of these uh, very independent kids, never wanted an aid did not want it, you know, um, at one time during recess when I was afraid of him falling off the equipment and all that, I asked the EAs that were there for other students to please just keep an eye on Sean and if he falls, just go and help him up. Because kids, you know, they help sometimes, but they don't other times. Two days later, he comes home and says, mom, they're stalking me, make them stop. So he was just not a kid that took very kindly to that. But if you do need that, that's in, that'll be, when, once they get the ministry designation, that'll be in their IEP and, you know, you can access all those services. Um, and high school becomes, you know, even more challenging because they're rotating classroom to classroom. There's lockers to deal with. There is um, a whole varied number of staff. Developmentally, you know, kids become more about themselves than about helping others. So it's a challenge, but again, same kind of philosophy. Oh, actually, I forgot in elementary school, be involved in the school. I mean, I was on the pack all the way through from the time Sean was in kindergarten all the way till he graduated from elementary school and then into high school. In, in high school, I think I was one of four months. We basically ran the parent advisory committee. With the pack, you get access to school administration that you never have in any other way. You know what's happening, even with your child. You know, you ask Sean, how was your day at school? Oh, it's okay. And then you'd find out all these things were going on from the PAC meetings where the principal would give their report. And um, plus you get that personal relationship with the administration. And then, so they know you and they know what kind of a person you are. And then they'll give your child the benefit of the doubt off, more often than not, I found. So in high school, same thing. We'd have a kickoff meeting, um, usually not at the very beginning of the year. It's just really busy when they start, but end of September-ish. And I'd invite all the teachers. We'd take in a lunch, either, you know, Subway or Quiznos or something, take in drinks, and then basically just chat with them. What is DMD, Sean's particular situation, um, how he is dealing with things, how he's feeling about things, um, things to watch for, things that he needs help with, all that kind of stuff. And um, the resource teachers in high school were very, very important because there was always one assigned to him. So that was your contact person for anything that they might have missed what they might have need, needed. And so again, in, in high school, the things we kind of pushed for was, you know, modifying the length of assignments. So in math, for example, instead of doing every question, do every other question or every third question, you know, for the whole problem set. So that you make sure they get the concept just so it's not writing. I mean, writing became, you know, tiring as time went on. Um, switching between classes. Sean always got to leave five minutes early and often with a buddy so that he could make it to the next class and, before the hallways got really crowded and then the risk of bumping into him and knocking him down, that kind of thing. Sean uh, walked till he was about in grade, end of grade 10. Um, I think, and then but halfway through grade 10, we started using a scooter, but he would not use it all day. He would just use it in the hallway to get from one class to the other and then park it at the door and then walk to his desk. So um, the leaving early really helped with the hallway situation. Um, what else did we do in high school? 
Yeah, then you deal with the whole transition to the chair. Um, you know, that's, again, like Riley said, it was something that was really feared. I think, yeah, it was really one of these all oh, scary things. Oh my gosh, my kid's going to be in a wheelchair. But honest goodness, like Riley said, I mean, it's just the sense of independence it gave him and being able to zoom around. And if, the, if his friends were going to McDonald's down the street for lunch, he could go with them and actually beat them there usually. Um, so that was really good. Um, just and, and later high school, you know, when it's time to start talking about universities, I think Anne's very right. Nobody in school knows what to tell your kids, you know. Sean was a very bright guy. He graduated, you know, top of his class. So I knew that university was a real possibility for him, but they seemed to be kind of discouraging that. So again, GF Strong is a wonderful resource for all kinds of stuff like that. And they know, they get it. Um, so that's really important. And then in every university, so Sean was, uh, my husband and I both graduated from UBC, so that's the one he was really interested in. But we looked at others too. And every single university or college has an uh, office for access and diversity. That's their entire job is to help students with disabilities navigate their way. And they're amazing. They send um, a letter of accommodation to every single professor. And that letter of accommodation is the law. I mean, basically, the professors have to, it's by law, they have to, I mean, the students' rights are protected, so they have to follow what's in that um, letter of accommodation. So with Sean, we had things like, you know, extra time for exams and quizzes. So we started off with 25% extra time, then we went to 50% extra time um, by the end. Um, uh, the right to write his exams at the Access and Diversity office. So it's a, it's a much more pleasant, less stressful way to write an exam because they have one invigilator, one student, he goes into a room by himself. So if he wants to dictate some of his exam, some of the essay types and the long answer questions, he can dictate, you know, they have him set up with his computer and his microphone and the invigilator is right in the room, but that was definitely very, very helpful. Um, big snowfall, you know, nobody shoveled the walks. So, you know, access diversity got one of the maintenance guys to just basically follow Sean around for the day, shoveling wherever he needed to go. So, I mean, people are very, very helpful. Um, parking, um, access diversity set it up for us with parking. Sean got his designated parking spot because he drives himself to school. He actually, um, yeah, it's a spot, a spot right outside the main building where all his classes are. And yeah, lots of room for his ramp to open. He goes in, goes out. I mean, he's, you know, makes him more independent. Um, that's about it, you know, for school. And I'm happy to answer any questions or have any discussion afterwards. Thank you, V. That was loaded with good information. Very good indeed. All right. So next, we are going to go on to from Pemberton, which is oh, just. Cindy, can I say one more thing? Sorry. Yeah. So all the way through school, parents, please, please, please make sure that there's a specific designated plan with designated people for evacuation in case of an emergency. That's one thing I forgot to say. Yeah, I did that all the way through and stressed about it. And high school had a lot of stairs and they had a couple of elevators that were always on the fritz. So, you know, it was just like, that's the thing I pounded with them all the time is safety evacuation plan. Sorry, that was the thing I no, forgot. Good. Very good. <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties. And I just wanted to say that um, both Anne and V talked about the vocational services at GF Strong. And so most of our grads we do send to GF Strong. There's actually the brochure on the GF Strong vocational rehab services is actually online here. And I think it's on the agenda handout. Okay, so you can have a look at that there. All right, so next we have from Pemberton, which is way past Whistler, um, Susie and Alexander McCormick, who are both, uh, well, graduates from the neuromuscular clinic too, as everyone is here. Can you hear me? Can you hear us? Okay, all right. So thank you everyone for inviting us. Um, we've been asked to share with you Alexander and his family's experience with trach and ventilation. Alexander had a brother, Andrew, who was 10 years older than him. Andrew also was trach and ventilated. He had congestive heart failure, which caused him not to be able to breathe properly, so they had to trach and ventilate him. Unfortunately, Andrew passed away January 1st, 2004. He was 24 years old. 
And at some point after Andrew's passing, the conversation had come up whether or not Alexander would ever want to be traked. And he had told us that this is something he did not want to have done. And so we said, okay, you know, if that's what you, how you feel, that's fine. And then in the spring of 2009, Alexander got a chest infection and he ended up in hospital and it turned to pneumonia. And after a few days in the hospital, it progressively got worse. And he had um, full collapse of both lungs. So at that point, he was intubated and sent to ICU and they had him heavily sedated. And a few days after that, um, the doctor met with us and my husband and I had uh, a meeting with the doctors and the doctors had explained that Alexander needed to be traked and ventilated in order to survive this. And with us knowing that this is not something Alexander wanted, we were really struggling with this and couldn't make a decision for Alexander because we knew what he had said he wanted, but we didn't know for certain if that was actually his wishes. So, we asked the doctor if they could wake him up enough so that the doctor could talk to him and explain what was happening to him and let the decision be his. And um, we feel that it's very important that Alexander make decisions for his own life and, and what he wants. So at that point, they woke him up and um, Alexander, I'll let you tell your side of what happened. I remember when they woke me up, I couldn't talk. And the doctor told me that I was really sick and that my lungs were not working properly. He said that both my lungs had collapsed. I could not breathe on my own. The doctor told me that they perform a tracheostomy and put me on the ventilator. If I did not want to do it, I would die. I agreed to have the trachea, tracheostomy and I'm very happy I did this. It was the best decision I made for myself. Something we have learned in life. That until you are faced with this life or death situation, you never really know what you will decide. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind. Yeah, and that being said, we're very happy that Alexander decided this as well. But everybody's different and people have their own wishes in life. And Alexander's is to continue to uh, make muscular dystrophy an awareness to all people in all communities. And uh, hopefully we'll have some treatment soon. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And thank you all for speaking about your different transitions. I believe that someone behind the scenes now is gonna spin us around and we're gonna go into different rooms randomly. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. Thank you all for, for sharing your experiences this morning. Uh, extremely moving, extremely emotional, extremely informative. So thank you all so very much.